Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's History Highlight Series. We appreciate you being here tonight. I wanted to start by thanking our community partners for this event, Legacy Senior Communities, Mosaic Family Services, Reach of Dallas, SMU Human Rights Program, Southwest Jewish Congress, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, and The Family Place. As always, we appreciate your support. My name is Annie Black and I am the Director of Programs and Volunteers for the museum. Uh, and before we get into tonight, I wanted to just mention a couple things. We do welcome questions whenever you might have them during tonight's program. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and locate your Q&A button, it will probably be at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer, it might be at the top if you are on a tablet or other mobile device. Um, so anytime you have a question, feel free to open that up, type your question in, and we will either answer it along the way or get to it at the end of the program. Uh, tonight, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, Chief Education, Education Officer at the museum, and Felicia Williamson, our Director of Library and Archives. We're going to start by hearing a little bit about uh, Eichmann himself, as well as the history of the trial uh, from Dr. Abosh, and then Felicia will give us an overview of some of the artifacts we have in the museum's collection related to Eichmann and the trial. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with just a little bit about the aftermath of the trial and get to your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson and Felicia Williamson. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Felicia, any housekeeping that you wanna do before we, before we get started? I'm gonna share my screen. We'll have a few overview discussion points from Dr. Sarah Abosh, and then we'll get into the artifacts. I'm gonna share my screen and show you the PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> uh, I like a woman who gets right to it. So who was Adolf <laughs> Eichmann? Uh, transportation and logistics manager or something more? Uh, the answer is, is considerably more. Uh, but before, before we get to that, let me first give you a, the, the, the nickel tour of, of Eichmann's uh, life. So uh, he's born in 1906. Um, and uh, he is born um, in uh, Germany slash uh, uh, Prussia. Um, he is born to uh, a, a father who is a, um, a businessman of sorts, a mother who is a, who is a homemaker. Um, he has a very undistinguished uh, school career. Uh, and in fact, um, he's such an indifferent student uh, that his father pulls him out of an academic high school that he's in and puts him into a technical high school. He never finishes the technical high school and he leaves the school before graduation and goes to work for his father. Um, he works for his father uh, briefly. Uh, his father, his father uh, uh, is a uh, owner of a mining company. Uh, from there, uh, he kind of kicks around um, Austria, uh, takes a number of uh, jobs, ultimately ends up as an oil salesman, uh, spends a few years doing that, um, but, but doesn't advance particularly and is nothing uh, particularly unusual. What's interesting about that period, so the period from about 1927 to about 1933-34, is what he does do during those years is spend time in um, ideological groups for young men who ultimately, many of whom uh, will go on to be active in the Nazi party. Uh, and it's in his membership in these groups that he really imbibes uh, Nazi ideology, particularly anti-Semitic ideology, uh, uh, fascist rightist ideology, all of these, these kinds of things. And that's significant because at the trial, he attempts to portray himself. And, and if you read Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, he does it successfully. Um, but he attempts to portray himself simply as a small cog in a large Nazi machine, that he's just an administrator, a faceless bureaucrat. He's not evil. He has no commitment to anything except making sure that if he sets a schedule, he meets the schedule. If he, if he sets a budget, he meets the budget. Um, if he promises to deliver something on time, in this case, the delivery is Jews, but, but 
who's paying attention. But if he, if he promises to deliver something on time, he'll deliver something on time. But that's it. He has no commitment beyond the kind of black and white uh, administrative uh, elements of his job. And, and I would put to you, and, and we'll come back to this, that that simply isn't true. Anyway, fast forward to uh, 1932, uh, he joins the SS. Um, uh, shortly before the Nazis come to power, the Nazis come to power in January of 33. So he is not one of the first or even the earliest members of the SS or of the Nazi party, but he certainly um, involved with them uh, through these youth groups and other things but before uh, 33. Um, at, once the Nazis uh, come to power, he uh, moves through a series, again, of administrative positions, uh, ultimately landing uh, in Austria and later Berlin. And what he is responsible for in these positions working uh, for, the, for the SD, so the Sicherheitsdienst, the, the so the, the, basically the, the, the police, the, but the political police force. Um, he is responsible for knowledge of Jews and also for emigration of Jews because it is his role in these early years, so these pre-September 1, 1939 uh, uh, period to force the Jews, pressure the Jews, work on getting the Jews to leave Austria and, 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 and later on to, to, to leave Germany as well. Um, that's going to change once the war breaks out. Um, but just to give you a sense of the fact that he takes this, his work seriously. We do know that in the 1930s, he visits Palestine. He meets with some uh, mid-level Zionist officials. Um, the meetings don't go well. He's hoping that they will pay money and in exchange for that money, they will take Jews and he will be able to, you know, to shunt more Jews out of, out of Austria. Um, it's not a successful trip, but, but he tries. Um, we know that during this period, he masters a, a few words in Hebrew, he masters a few words in English, excuse me, not in English, in uh, Yiddish, and he becomes, as far as um, his uh, 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 boss, um, Reinhard Heydrich, is concerned, the go-to man and the expert on all things Jewish. Um, it, it's, it's not really an accurate assessment on Heydrich's part, um, but, 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 it, but it, that is the assessment. So um, fast forward into the invasion of Poland and the beginning of the war, and Eichmann is shifted to helping work on the ghettoization policies, again, by, by Heydrich. And what he is supposed to do uh, in October, November, December, that, that early uh, period of uh, 39 is to help to centralize the Jews and those will, those centralizations will occur in ghettos and then the ultimate plan at that point uh, is for Eichmann to move them out of those centralized ghettos and into holding pens probably in the east, uh, the, there's something called the, the the, the, the NISCO plan, um, and, and the thought was to move, you know, hundreds of thousands of Jews eastward, uh, nothing much comes of it. There's a, a few thousand Jews who ultimately are shipped out there uh, early in, I think it's 4041, um, and they're basically left in, in, in miserable conditions, but, but nothing comes of it. Uh, another plan that's proposed by Eichmann uh, is the Madagascar plan. Um, part of the plan is to shift a million Jews a year to the island of Madagascar. Um, a combination of uh, the failure of the uh, attempted invasion against Britain so Britain can block the sea lanes so that the, that the Nazis are able, never able to do this, uh, plus followed by the fact that, that Madagascar is owned by, owned, it's, you know, it's, it's a French uh, 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 owned uh, territory at that point. Um, and once France joins um, the Nazis, the French uh, uh, Vichy government has absolutely no interest in, in, you know, in housing millions of Jews on this island. It's not really a practical uh, project anyway. 
Fast forward to the uh, Operation Barbarossa and the June uh, 21st, 22nd invasion of the Soviet Union by the Nazis in 1941. And all of a sudden, the Jewish question, which is a question that Reinhard Heydrich has been putting to Eichmann as his assistant, you know, you, we have to solve this, we have to solve this, we have to, we have to work on this, this question. Um, the question becomes, infinitely more crucial because now you have millions of Jews who have fallen under Nazi control. Uh, the first thing that the Nazis do is they, is they bring in their Einsatzgruppen, their, their um, SS killing squads immediately behind the lines of their invading uh, um, army uh, troops and they begin to kill Jews uh, where they live in the east and about two million Jews are killed as part of this process and Eichmann actually at one point goes east to kind of get a feel for this and a sense for this. Um, within the Nazi hierarchy it becomes clear uh, as the summer moves into the winter of 41 that this type of up close and personal and just rapid fire, endless killing and killing and killing and killing is taking a toll on the killers and that they're gonna have to come up with something else. The other part of this is that they have a large Jewish population still resident in Western Europe and they can't kill them in Western Europe so they've gotta do something with them. Um, and the long and the short of it is that um, Eichmann along with uh, Heydrich and Himmler um, call the Wannsee Conference. Um, and the Wannsee Conference uh, meets in January of 42. And what is really decided at the conference is who will be involved in the final solution administratively, managerially, who will be responsible for transportation, who will be responsible for, for building the death camps, who will be responsible for handling the Jews, who will be responsible for making sure that Jewish property, Jewish clothing, uh, anything monetarily connected to the Jews gets properly turfed out and um, is accounted for and financially uh, is returned to the Reich for, for, you know, for uh, the Nazi administrative purposes, all of those kinds of things. Um, that is January of 42. And it's not that mass killings haven't already occurred. It's that, as I said, it, the sense is now that the solution as it's being um, implemented in the East isn't workable, it's, it's simply too difficult. So, so what Von Zay does, and, and it's under um, uh, the administrative uh, control of uh, Eichmann, is to establish that the SS will, will, will run this process, that all of these other governmental agencies will report to the SS. And Eichmann becomes the upper mid-level uh, manager who coordinates the identification, the assembly, and the transportation of millions of Jews across occupied Europe into the death camps. So, so that is basically Eichmann uh, during the war in a nutshell. So um, the point is, is he simply a transportation or logistics manager? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, he is extremely ideologically, philosophically committed to doing this to the Jews. He is an anti-Semite. Um, he is not the kind of colorless, faceless, nameless, uh, beige bureaucrat that he fights desperately to portray himself as uh, at the uh, trial in Jerusalem. Um, and I will come back to that in just a moment. Uh, Felicia, do we have the next slide that takes us onto the trial? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing yeah, that please. struck me when you were talking, which is one of the most grotesque things about Eichmann is that part of the way his ambition plays out mm -hmm. in the SS is making himself invaluable to his superiors as someone who is going to address the Jewish problem. So yep. his ambition gets tied with the final solution inextricably. Right. Um, and he uses it to climb the ladder, essentially. Um, he does. 
Um, but there are a couple of slip ups that he's involved. Right. In. One that I'm thinking of is the slip up in 44 um, in the period uh, after uh, Hungary is invaded. So Hungary is the erstwhile ally of the Nazis. Um, Horthy is ultimately overthrown, the, the, the head of Hungary. Um, the Nazis enter uh, Hungary and between May and July of 44, they begin the mass deportations of the last large untouched Jewish population in Europe, and that is Hungary's Jewish population. And about midway through this process, Himmler himself contacts Eichmann and says, shut it down, because there are other things that they are interested in. They may well come back to, to Hungary's Jews to, to finish the, 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 the murder of the Jews, but Eichmann is, is ordered to stand down, and Eichmann does not stand down. Eichmann spends several weeks beyond that, continuing to roll those trains, continuing to ship Hungary's Jews to Auschwitz and continuing to make sure that they are uh, murdered and accounted for when they get to Auschwitz. Um, so again, you know, that's not how a faceless bureaucrat operates. A faceless bureaucrat doesn't get an order from, from his boss and, and then say, no, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna go this way or I'm gonna go this way. It's, it's, it's very interesting and it's very telling. Um, the reason Eichmann's uh, trial and arrest are so important is because they open a new chapter in how Israel viewed the Holocaust and in how the West uh, more generally uh, viewed the Holocaust, and I guess the world viewed the Holocaust. So to, to cover um, Eichmann uh, is uh, captured in 46 by the Americans. Uh, but he isn't known as Adolf Eichmann. He's under, he's under an assumed name. Um, I think he's captured a couple of times by the Americans. Um, he manages to escape. And he manages to escape because he finds out that they have, they're almost ready to figure out who he really is. You know, and that, that, that would be a significant get for the Americans. Um, so in 47, I believe it is, he manages to escape from American control. And by 1950, he manages uh, under an assumed identity, uh, the identity of Ricardo Clement, to make his way to Argentina um, with uh, the help of uh, the Austrian uh, bishop, uh, Alwa Hudel, who uh, helped to operate one of these uh, post-war pro-Nazi rat lines, you know, to, to get these guys uh, to safety. Um, when Ricardo Clement, you know, AKA Eichmann, makes it to Argentina, he ultimately makes it to Buenos Aires. He lives in a suburb of Buenos Aires. Uh, by 52, he has sent for his wife and his children. Um, he uh, finds a job in the Mercedes Benz plant, how fitting. Um, and he lives what many people say is a very low key life except that the life isn't nearly as low key as somebody like Hannah Arendt would have you believe. In 1957, Eichmann grants a series of interviews to a Dutch XSS uh, figure named Wilhelm Sassen. Um, and Wilhelm Sassen is a, is a pro-Nazi. He uh, lives in Argentina and Eichmann spends days and days and days and days talking to Sasson about his role in the final solution, about the importance of the final solution, about the legacy of the Nazis, and really about what he sees as the, the Nazis' responsibility to the future because Eichmann it is very clear um, in the Sassen papers, does not think that this is over and done with. So he gives these interviews in 57, two of them in, in, in very, very short form, Sassen ultimately sells to Life Magazine and they appear in Life Magazine. 
okay, that's very interesting. But why do I base some of what I say about Eichmann on some interviews? Because they're not just interviews. As it turns out, there are 1,300 pages of typed interviews testimony that he gives to Sasson, and then Sasson gives him the typed transcripts of their conversations, and then um, Eichmann puts marginal notes around the sides of this stuff for things that he thinks that Sasson didn't get right. Um, Bettina Strangnith, uh, Strangnith, excuse me, in her book, uh, Eichmann Before Jerusalem, The Unexamined Life of a Mass uh, Murderer, uh, which came out in 2011, and it's an excellent, excellent book if anybody has a chance uh, to take a look at it. Um, but she goes back and combs through those um, Sasson interviews, and she cannot get over how different the... Eichmann, who is setting up his legacy for future generations, is from the man who basically, without pleading for his life, is really pleading for his life uh, in, in Jerusalem. They are not the same man. It's, 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 it's very clear to Stagnath and, and subsequently to, to, to a whole series of other uh, newer historians who've gone back through this material that, in fact, what Eichmann did in Jerusalem was to put on a show. Um, that that wasn't the real Eichmann. Um, the other part of this is that Eichmann is very, very, very involved uh, in Nazi and neo-Nazi uh, circles and very active and publicly so in Argentina. And the Argentinians make no effort to shut them down. I mean, as far as the Argentinians are, are concerned, he can, he can function there with reasonable impunity. Um, in fact, I think that the reason he is under an assumed name is because he doesn't want to deal with the potential wrath of uh, the Israelis. So back to the arrest and the trial. The reason the arrest and the trial are so important is because on the world scene, we've gone through Nuremberg, we've gone through the, the international military tribunals, the Dachau trials, all of these various trials. And I think that the thought is that, that that's it. We, we put paid to this check and we move on. The Holocaust is over. These people are no longer around. This is no longer significant. And what happens is that the Israelis get wind of the fact that Eichmann is in um, Buenos Aires and they've been hunting for him for more than a decade. And they finally manage to confirm that it is in fact Eichmann and they put together a capture team uh, and they go in to get him. And they go in not to kill him, they go in to bring him back to Israel because they wanna put him on trial because they want to give voice to the voiceless. They want to give voice to all of these survivors who had no chance ever to be publicly heard about what had happened to them, what had happened to their families. They're doing this for that. They're doing this, I think, um, to, to let the Israelis know um, some of what happened to their, to their brethren in the diaspora. Um, and the way in which they do it is very, very interesting. And then, and then I'm gonna wrap up and we'll, we'll go into to, um, Felicia's uh, uh, kind of archival exploration of this. Um, the team that the Israelis send to Argentina is headed uh, by Isser Harel. Uh, he is the head of the Israeli secret services. Notice I say secret services, because until 63, when he stood down, uh, he occupied a highly unusual position. He was head of both the Israeli Mossad, so the Israeli equivalent of our Central Intelligence Agency, so the organization that goes after foreign terrorists. At the same time, he held the, 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 the head of uh, uh, the Shin Beit of the Israeli um, FBI. Uh, so, so under his leadership, the two services were merged. That's highly unusual, particularly in a democracy, although this was the very early years of, of, of Israel's existence. Harel decides that he is going to personally head the team that goes into Argentina 
um, to to uh, Garibaldi Street, uh, where where um, Eichmann lives, to grab Eichmann. Um, they the team grabs grabs him, picks him up on the street, May eleventh, nineteen sixty. Um, they uh, spend about nine days interrogating him until it becomes crystal clear that he is who they who they think he is. Um, and they convince him to allow them on some level to bring him back to Israel. They then um, drug him uh, so that he looks like uh, he's either sick or he's drunk. They dress him in the clothes of, of an Israeli uh, crew member, a, a flight crew member, and they fly him back to Israel. Um, that's May 20th. He lands in Israel on May 22nd and May 23rd, 1960. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion announces to the entire world that he's been captured. Um, all hell breaks loose in Argentina. There's all kinds of anti-Semitic incidents that occur there. Uh, remember, this guy was not hiding from Argentinians. He was, he was hiding from Israelis and, and, and from, from others. Um, the United States is not thrilled by this because they think that this may throw a wrench in some of their Cold War plans, and they do not want to, they do not want to um, annoy or upset uh, the, the apple cart in Argentina. Um, April 11th of 61, so the following year, uh, the trial of Eichmann uh, begins. And at that trial, and then I'm going to back off because Felicia is going to show you uh, all kinds of photographic illustrations of what goes on there. But at that trial, they bring 112 witnesses for uh, the prosecution, and a large chunk of those witnesses are survivors. And that is the first time that many Israelis officially hear from people who actually experienced the tender mercies of Eichmann and the Nazis. Um, it had been in many ways brushed under the rug as part of the, the larger concern about this state building project because Israel was fighting for its for its very life in its early years, no question. And remember, this is pre-67, it's pre the Six Day War, um, but it is an eye opener as they begin to testify. And that testimony is carried not just in Israel on uh, the radio, it's carried worldwide on, on the newsreels. Um, so this is done not just for Israel to see, this is done for the entire world to see essentially representational justice done. Felicia. Well, that's a great baton to toss my way and I'll pick up the baton <laughs> of, of a focus on the victims. I think an, a potential danger in any sort of largely publicized trial like the Eichmann trial was, is a um, avoidance or lack of emphasis on the victims. And so one of the things they got right was inviting the public to see the trial, but emphasizing and saving the seat, as it were, for the victims. So um, victims were in the audience every day of the trial. Uh, victims were called to the bench, women, men, all ages, um, with, with details that many people had not allowed themselves to face yet. Um, and that was meaningful and had a, a large impact on people people's understanding of the Holocaust. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about two artifact collections that the museum has acquired um, in the past five years. The first one is the Levine collection of Eichma materials. Dr. Levine out of Fort Worth um, donated this collection. It's really a series of collections to the museum. He became interested in justice issues surrounding the Eichmann trial and collected quite a substantial collection. We're so thankful for him sharing those materials with us. Um, you'll see a lot of them are um, related to the press coverage of the trial, but then there's two significant artifacts in the, in the mix. So as Sarah was saying, you know, huge headlines all over the world, including in Israel. And so we have a couple of Israeli newspapers um, Eichmann captured in prison in Israel, and this was a huge deal. Some of the most interesting photos, hopefully I've got one next, nope, not next, um, coming up in a minute, um, are you can see crowd shots of Israeli reactions to the trial and the arrests 
um, and it was a point of pride and um, and I think helps the state of Israel get settled into themselves and become more established on the world stage. This is a photo, a press picture of Adolf Eichmann. Um, it says that he was discovered by Jewish volunteers, and I think that's a charitable way of looking at it. Um, well, hold on, hold on. Little, little, little interesting historical factoid. I just looked it up today. I'm very excited. Okay, so, go for it. They were called volunteers by the head of Israel's government. Um, subsequently, um, uh, well, uh, it was uh, by uh, Golda Meir. Um, so, so, and and uh, so, I guess minister, not not the head of the government. And the reason they were called volunteers is because if they had officially represented the state of Israel, then it's a state to state problem. And so they actually, the Israelis drafted a foreign ministry letter that went out to the Argentinians in which they said, these were volunteers. You know, I hate it when our people just kind of go rogue like that. I mean, they literally did that. So that's why they're called volunteers. That's awesome. My husband would call that very sar sarcastically a whoops-a-daisy. <laughs> um, well, and one thing I read that you're reminding me of is this idea that Argentina was up in arms, Germany was very concerned, the U.S. was wringing their hands, and really all of it was, I don't want to deal with Nazi criminals. All of it was, keep us out of it, don't rock the boat like you said. And so, and Israel was in a precarious um, situation because they, 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 volunteered to abduct Eichmann because they knew there was no chance of getting extradition. Um, and so they had to work around what was actually an injustice. But, okay. So this is a really cool panoramic photo um, of the cross section where Eichmann was uh, apprehended. There, the, the mission to uh, get Eichmann or arrest Eichmann was almost called off because they, they, sco they staked him out, they, they figured out which bus he took, and he must have missed his bus, and he was 30 minutes late. And they thought, oh, he's on to us, something's going wrong, we're going to scratch the mission, and it very nearly didn't happen. But they, they staked their claim, they waited around, and he, he got on the, a different bus, and he showed up, and they approached him. Um, he was very scared. They basically tackled him and took him away for interrogation. So this is that crowd photo that I wanted to talk about earlier. This is a bunch of Israelis looking at headlines. Um, and, you know, at this point, Eichmann is basically in house arrest. The, in my view, Israel does a lot of work to make sure that he's well cared for, well taken care of, that his rights are being um, granted, and they want him to stand up to justice because I think it was very important in light of the fact that Goering, even Hitler, had taken his own life, um, had not been, had not had to face his own crimes, was insulting, and there was a hope that Eichmann would be able to face his own crimes and be and be under the jurisdiction and justice system in Israel and, and face potential punishment. But that couldn't happen if he wasn't well cared for. Um, and they went to great lengths to protect Eichmann during this time. So to that end, this is a picture of the construction of the glass booth. So bulletproof glass where Eichmann could stand trial and relative safety from assassination attempts. You know, it does remind me a little bit about, you know, Jack Ruby here in Dallas, um, this idea that someone didn't stand trial because he was assassinated. Uh, here's Eichmann. He provided a lot of one imagines more or less wanted input into his own trial. Um, we have some notes that he wrote. There's some pictures I'm going to show you of him, you know, very forcibly arguing for it in his own defense. There was feedback on the, on, from the standpoint of some witnesses of the trial that he was convincing as a witness in his own defense. Um, and, you know, I think that's a little, it's hard to imagine through the lens of history that we have now. 
Uh, here's a, a view of the crowd waiting to see if they can find out more about the trial. Um, there was, this trial lasted a long time and there was a lot of jostling around trying to get a seat of the trial, lining up to get in. We'll find out it was possible sometimes, but they gave priority to victims, which I think is important. Uh, this is a victim talking about her experience. Um, she um, gives some very challenging testimony and even shows some wounds that she suffered. Um, incredibly impactful and just for those of us who've seen, you know, documentary after documentary and read book after book, I want to take a moment and say, take yourself back to 1961. What have you seen? What have you heard? Um, as camps were liberated, GIs saw the camps. Um, it was a big emphasis on evidence. The trials in, in Nuremberg um, brought a lot of the atrocities to light, but this was a internationally watched and followed trial about the murder of, of European Jews. Here is a picture of Eichmann um, and one of his big tactics was to, in my view, just almost obsessively document the bureaucracy of the Nazis and the SS. So here we have this, he's, he's got this huge chart saying, hey, look at all these guys, look at all these players. How, why are you coming after me? I was just doing my job, which is the same old refrain. Um, but he went to a lot of effort to prove his point. Here he is kind of uh, thumping that Bible, if you will, and saying, you know, I was following orders. I, I did my job, look the other way. Here he is receiving his guilty uh, verdict in the glass booth there. I think it's interesting, you can see the, the, the judges. One thing I want to take a minute to mention is that he was given good counsel. Um, Robert Servatius, his lawyer, by the little reading I've done, did attempt to defend his client, and that's not with not something we should skate over. Uh, I think the Israelis had to do a fair amount of work to make sure he had representation. Um, this, I, I, I snipped this picture um, from the collection. There's a many more images and artifacts in this collection. I had to be um, judicious in how I selected them. I picked this one because as Sarah was saying, um, you know, Eichmann was a rabid anti-Semite. He was a um, enthusiastic Nazi. Um, this photo is taken of his home at his home. Um, in 1964, so Eichmann's already been sentenced to death and received the death penalty, but this is his home in 1964. It's his son walking towards the home, and they're proudly displaying a Nazi banner. So clearly that ideology impacted the family and was very out in the open. Um, not a lot of reflection or um, change of heart um, on evidence here. This picture is some evidence presented at the Eichmann trial. So a memorial candle, some Zyklon B. Um, we have a Zyklon B canister on display at the museum, but I, I just in looking at this briefly, I noticed there's another artifact we have, which is really unusual. Um, and they have one in this evidence box and that's a crematoria tag. Um, and, you know, crematoria tags are unusual um, and under some debate with historians about what they're used for, but here they clearly used it as evidence in the Eichmann trial. So it was just fascinating. And just to be clear, a crematoria tag is made of plaster. It's not made of ashes, but it's used to identify ashes. At least that's our understanding. Um, so I mentioned there's a couple of um, primary source documents from the trial. This is in Eichmann's handwriting. Um, and I just want to read his own words because to me they are the words of an annoy, annoyed or um, indignant person. So does one have to put up with these outrageous lies from the prosecutor without any recourse? The claims this man is making are really outrageous. The press accepts all of it with great pleasure. There were Polish transports which were directed to Auschwitz by WB4. 
This is supposed to sound like I also killed them. So he's saying, hey, I, I booked the trains. I didn't kill these people. But of course, from, from our view, I think, Sarah, I think you would agree, his orchestration and zealous orchestration of the Holocaust made it possible. Um, and yeah, but he, he, it, it's interesting. I'm um, looking back through, uh, this is another one, if anybody's interested in, in pursuing more, um, this is called, and, and Felicia's going to get to this in just a moment, this is called Facing the Glass Booth by Chaim Guri. Uh, it first came out in Hebrew, this is the English language version, um, but Guri was an Israeli uh, journalist who covered the, um, the, the trial, the entire trial, I mean, he sat through the entire thing and it was, it was months because it ran from April to August of, of 61. So this was, this was a major um, slog. And again and again and again in the book, um, Eichmann refers to the document that, that Felicia is going to refer to in just a minute and, and, and brings out diagrams and just keeps talking about, you know, uh, 4B4, which was the, the subunit that he dealt with. It's just a very, very tiny cog in a big machine. Um, but what Guri comes to realize as he listens to all of this is that it's not a tiny cog, um, that it is a major part in making sure that Jews get from point A to point B, and that when they get to point B, they are murdered. So anyway. Right. So this is another artifact from that collection where, where <laughs> you know, Eichmann is trying to detail all the bureaucratic structures that he was participating in. Um, but as Sarah said, um, the, the administrative unit he was in charge of was tasked with the murder of Europeans Jews. So saying that that bureaucratic cover somehow he had nothing to do with it is a little bit hard to swallow. And I think the judges found that to be true. So here's a close up, although it's a little impossible. I can read German, but this is almost impossible to read. So I can't tell you too much about it, but there are those, um, the letters are stand-ins for the departments. In I the know, hierarchy. See, the, the department at the top of the block, uh, right here in the center, is is four B four. That that's the office that 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 he heads up. Right. Um, and again, it's absolutely central to everything that happens. Right. So, um, spoiler alert: Eichmann is is found guilty, and then the the there's a series of appeals and and a real struggle to get a sense of, is the death penalty appropriate? Um, and I wanna let you talk about that a little bit, Sarah, since it is a special case in Israeli history. Okay, um, so uh, Israel doesn't have a death penalty um, and it hasn't since, since, it's, since its founding. Uh, and that was a deliberate decision made by, by the founders of the state. Um, it's particularly interesting when you consider um, the, the neighborhood of the world in which the state was founded um, and the fact that the state is, you know, under constant uh, um, military threat slash terrorist threat. Um, but the bottom line was that they were not going to, to do a death penalty. When they brought, when they captured Eichmann and they brought Eichmann back, they had high level discussions and a decision was made that if he was found guilty, and there were, there were 15 uh, charges that were brought against him, including um, uh, crimes against humanity, crimes against the Jewish people, um, war crimes. Um, but if these charges uh, stuck and the uh, judges uh, convicted him, um, they dis a decision was made that the death penalty was on the table, that that could be the ultimate pe uh, penalty. Um, and in fact, uh, he was convicted uh, on um, uh, December 12th, uh, 1961, and he was sentenced to death on December 15th, 1961. Uh, he did appeal. Um, he was allowed an appeal. Um, he, his appeal lost. He was then hanged uh, outside of Tel Aviv uh, in uh, May, May 31st of 1962 after which he was cremated 
after which his ashes were spread over the Mediterranean. Um, there was a very conscious decision on the part of the Israelis that this was the only crime that merited the death penalty, that in so meriting that death penalty, they did not want to provide a final resting place, a place uh, where people could come to venerate him. Um, and so they, you know, as I said, they, they hanged him, they cremated him, and they sprinkled his ashes. And, and so nobody knows, you know, where his, his earthly remains are. But it was a very deliberate, thought out approach uh, to, to his sentence. Uh, we have one more collection to discuss. This is a very interesting collection. It was uh, brought to our attention um, by some of our, the friends of the museum, um, an attorney um, named Dennis Eichelbaum. This is his uncle, Edward Eichel. He's an artist in New York. Um, and he was a starving artist student traveling through Europe when the Eichmann trial uh, became the biggest story going. He found himself fascinated by the trial and made his way hitchhiking through Europe to Jerusalem, which is a little hard to imagine. Um, and he manages to get a seat in the trial. Towards the end of the trial, during the sentencing phase, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and he was an artist, and so he felt inspired to try through art to represent what he saw to be a truly evil man in Eichmann. Um, and so fortunately, uh, Sarah um, went to interview Eichel and got uh, some more information about that experience. And then Eichel, over the course of uh, several donations, donated about 20 of his courtroom drawings and then a painting. So this is the painting of, of Eichmann. Um, I think it's interesting in that it's both beautiful and colorful and chilling. Um, I guess that's the beauty of art. You can transmit a lot of information and emphasis. Um, these are some of the drawings from, from his spectator position in the courtroom. Um, this, of course, is Eichmann. The center uh, image you see there is Eichmann between his two uh, Israeli bodyguards. Um, there was some chatter in the press that Eichmann looked um, diminutive and insignificant in comparison to his burly um, keepers. Um, in the next couple of images, this is the judges. And then uh, to the right, this is Robert Savatius, Eichmann's uh, defense attorney. So we're very, uh, I do want to take a moment uh, to point out this, this image of, um, Oh, I'm, I'm totally on uh, menorah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> For a second, I was, I kept saying in the, my mind the wrong word, but I, I spit it out in the, in the end. So um, I, I, I've looked at this image a dozen times and just noticed that today. So those are a couple of our artifact collections. We have wrapped up just in time to take some questions. Um, and before we do that, um, we, we talked about whether we wanted to discuss if justice was served and then, you know, was he evil or was he a cog in, in a larger machine? Um, Sarah lined out those questions very effectively at the beginning. Um, and do we have any additional um, conclusions? So um, I because we're we're kind of tight on time, um, I would like to kind of weave some of these uh, questions absolutely um, into into this. Um, so uh, Evan Cohn wants to know why Eichmann voluntarily went back to Israel. Um, Evan, I can't answer that. Uh, all I can tell you is that in every account I've read of this. Um, they say that you know he signed this paper and he was willing to go back but having said that they still had to drug him because if the argentinians had known that it was eichmann they would have stopped them they would have stopped them at the airport um so i don't know if it's a voluntary 
uh, agreement a la the volunteers who were there, you know, uh, and not as representatives of the Mossad or employees of the Mossad. I, I, I can't answer that. I, I just am not uh, positive about that. Um, and then uh, Don White says it's interesting that the news copy in, in one of the um, artifact uh, photos that you uh, uh, showed, Felicia, referred to him as a former Nazi. Um, I think they're referring to him as a former Nazi because at the time the sense was that World War II was over, the Nazi party uh, and the Nazi regime had been defeated, so you couldn't still be a Nazi. It's not like today's notion, you know, Unfortunately, there are there are neo Nazis. There are all of these kinds of things, but these are these are later understandings of what you can and cannot be. The thought was, I think, that if the, the regime to which you were attached no longer exists, then you're a former Nazi. How can you be a member of something that no longer no longer is 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 in existence? Um, Lauren Ray asks if Eichmann uh, was identified in the Sassen uh, interview article published in Life magazine. I don't think he was. Um, I, I, I don't remember if they used, if Sassen used a, um, a code name or, or um, just kind of launched into the interview. It's been a long, long time since I, since I looked at, at some of that material. Um, but, but he wasn't publicly identified as Eichmann. And, and, and it's a good point to make, Lauren. Now, having said that, um, the Americans had been aware of Eichmann's presence in Buenos Aires for at least two years before the Israelis were. But because of some of their Cold War interests and other things, they didn't do anything with that information. So, so again, he was hidden, but he wasn't that well hidden. Um, we have uh, a question about how Eichmann uh, made his escape to Argentina. Did he go by boat or plane? Honestly, I would have to look that up. I... I, I he, he went, Lisa? he was on a boat. It took him okay. about two weeks. Okay. And um, he was under false identity. I mean, he was helped to get his paperwork in order and arrangements were made um, to help him on his way, but he went by boat. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris, uh, Christian Acevedo wants to know if there was anybody else aside from Eichmann held to the same standard of accountability. That's a good Absolutely. question. Absolutely. Um, first of all, the, the, the people who were tried at Nuremberg were, were held to this level of accountability. Um, there was an effort to trace down Martin Bormann uh, at the same time. Uh, Bormann was also in South America, and the Israelis thought they could snatch the two of them and try them both. Uh, Weren't they also they were going after Mengele? Yeah, Mengele as well, but they're not Borman. I'm sorry, my mistake, not Borman, Mengele, thank you. Um, it was Mengele, and they were told to stand down. They were told, you know, one person at a time. Uh, Mengele, on the basis of this, went back into even deeper hiding, um, and from what we know, Mengele actually died in a swimming accident. Uh, he drowned uh, several years after this, so, so they did not pick him up. But in answer to the question, are others held to the standard? Um, you know, we still have people who are hunting Nazis and the Nazis are in their mid to late 90s and they're still standing trial. Um, are they being sentenced to death? No. Are some of them being uh, jailed or put under house arrest for the rest of their lives? Yes. Um, and um, I'm, I'm thinking, of um, uh, the, oh gosh, I can't, we, we had him in to speak, Felicia. I'm just blanking on his name at the moment. Oh, Ephraim Zuroff uh, is, is, is one example of this. Um, Byron Garvey would like to know why Argentina provided refuge for Nazi criminals uh, like Eichmann. Well, Argentina was run by uh, a strong man, uh, Perón. Perón uh, was, fascistic in his leanings. Um, uh, he wasn't a Nazi by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but he was an admirer of Hitler's and he was an admirer of the Nazis. And so they were willing to give the Nazis safe haven. And it was known uh, that Argentina would provide safe haven. There's all kinds of, of uh, mid-level Nazi figures who, when they managed to get out of Europe, made their way into Argentina. 
Um, as far as Argentina's uh, relationship with the US, uh, the relationship has been a fraught relationship. Um, we had times when we got along very, very well with strongmen. We, got, we had other times when they had uh, leftist governments and we didn't want to have anything to do with them. So, so we, we have a problematic uh, relationship. Um, let's see, Robert Weiss wants to know, how can we find the interview that Eichmann participated while in Argentina where he talks about his complicity? So Robert, that is a great question. And you can look for it um, uh, online. It's the Sassen interview, S-A-S-S-E-N, -S -S -E first, first name Wilhelm, W-I-L-H-E-M. You can uh, also, I'll make a plug for just a terrific book. This is called Eichmann Before Jerusalem. I think it's backwards. Um, at least it looks backwards to me. Anyway. Um, it came out uh, in uh, 2011. It's by Bettina Stangneth, uh, S-T-A-N-G-N-E-T-H. And um, uh, she, uh, actually her, her specialty is philosophy. She write, writes about what she calls the unexamined life of a mass murderer. And it, it, it much of her research is based on those 1300 pages um, of, of um, Eichmann's own testimony, although she has, she, she goes into the archives as well. Just, just to give you a sense of this, she has in this volume, you know, this, this is not a book by a journalist, um, even though, you know, there's nothing wrong with books by journalists, but this is a, this is a flat out academic. Her footnotes range from page 424 uh, to page 534, so 110 pages of, of I love it. Notes, uh, followed, Felicia, by, by more than a dozen pages of bibliographic material. You would be Great. so happy. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but uh, I guess what I would, would add to all of this is uh, evil or simply cog in a larger machine. Um, I landed evil. Uh, and every time I, I read about Eichmann, every time, every time I, I, I look, by the way, at Hannah Arendt's account of Eichmann in, in her New Yorker articles, there was uh, four or five parts, massive parts in the New Yorker that ultimately were, were uh, formed by her into, into the book that she called Eichmann in Jerusalem. So it started out as a series of essays about the trials. And her problem with Eichmann was that Eichmann didn't look like what she thought evil should look like. And he didn't speak the way she thought somebody who was evil should speak. He was a bureaucrat. Um, but it becomes very, very clear as you read Stangneth and others, and as you read Eichmann's own words uh, from this much earlier um, uh, it, series of massive interviews that he gave, that he's not colorless, he's not faceless, he's not emotionless, he is an, he is an active anti-Semite, he is an active proponent of, of Nazi ideology, he, he is a true believer. Um, and he is, he is, you know, he's an evil man. I don't know how else to describe somebody who very comfortably puts in motion the mechanics to send millions of people, both Jews and Roma and others to their deaths. I mean, and he does it with no problems. Um, and there is a quote from him. He, he's quoted, uh, he talked to somebody who ultimately was a survivor that if he had to go to his grave knowing that all, he had, he had uh, and I'm paraphrasing, that he had been responsible for the deaths of 5 million Jews, he would go to his grave happy. Um, so, so, so you need to be very, very, um, uh, you, you need to take a, a rent's account with, with, a uh, with a tremendous amount of, um, of, of, uh, salt, hesitancy, because, because she saw what she wanted to see. She was looking for something and she found what she wanted to find. Um, Felicia? I'll make one final recommendation. If you're interested in the Iquin trial in partnership with Yad Vashem, um, if my memory serves, the entire trial is on YouTube. So the historic in, in, in tapes, multiple episodes. It's yeah. it's a it's it would be a commitment, but you can certainly spend some time making your own assessment of Eichmann based on the witness testimony. I mean it's a huge historic resource and so mm -hmm. more power to him that they've made it available. 
Yeah. Um, there are two, because we're, we're at the end of our time. There's just two, two little things that I want to wrap up because we have two more questions slash comments. Um, one is from uh, Rosie Ann Zerner, uh, and she uh, was actually at the Eichmann trial, and she comments that there are several films about Eichmann, his capture and trial. Can you comment on some of the conflicting information? Um, absolutely, Rosie Ann. Uh, the conflicting information is that these films are not documentaries. Uh, they're, um, they're meant to be entertainment. Uh, and entertainment, while it can be based in history, gives the person who directs it um, artistic license. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the most recent film that came out uh, on Eichmann, uh, um, which starred one of my favorites, Oscar Isaacs. Um, he, he plays one of the Mossad agents um, called Operation Finale. Um, and some of the conversations that they depict in, in that between Oscar Isaacs as the Mossad agent and uh, Adolf Eichmann are apocryphal. Um, but it adds to dramatic tension. Um, it helps to flesh out the story. Um, and so that, that is how it's done. But th these are not documentaries. Um, and, you know, frankly, they have the right, if they're making a, a, fictional, a, a fictionalized account of an actual event, they have the right to do this. Um, and then the final question is from Michelle Schreiro, uh, who would like to know if Eichmann expressed any remorse at the trial. And the answer would be a resounding heck no. And the reason he doesn't express any remorse at the trial is because to express remorse would be to say he had done something wrong. And at no point during the trial does he admit to having done anything wrong. He was simply a bureaucrat doing his job, following orders, doing what it was that he was being paid to do, whatever that would be. Um, and he, he goes to tremendous lengths to say this again and again and again, which frankly flies in the face of the 1957, um, you know, extensive interviews that he gave that were clearly meant to be his, his you know, kind of his legacy and living testament. Um, because he ultimately, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but Eichmann was planning on, on getting all of this material um, back from Wilhelm Sassen and using it as, as the, the, the guts of a book that he was going to write about his philosophy and his life. So, so there, there, there's your answer. Um, Annie, would you like to take us out? I would. Thank you so much, Sarah and Felicia. As always, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. If you'd like to check out future programs, please please visit our website, dhhrm.org. We will see you next time and everyone uh, stay healthy and safe. Thanks for joining us.